This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines. We are broadcasting live from the beautiful Think Tech Hawaii TV studio in the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. This show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. Today's special guest is an educator, author, the co-founder of Seeds of Peace, and she is the famous sister of our <laughs> former President Barack Obama. She is truly an extraordinary woman who is also helping to advance the objectives of her brother's Obama Foundation. She is Dr. Maya Sutoro Ng, and today we are going beyond the first family. Maya, great to have you here today. So good to be here, thank you. I know that you were born in Indonesia. I was. Can you tell me about your early life? Yes, my, my mother, our mother, was um, a woman who was a pioneer in microfinance and she um, worked uh, with cottage industries and um, uh, helped to create uh, small businesses that allowed particularly women uh, to um, contribute to their families and communities and to keep the economy resilient. And so we went all over uh, Asia in particular um, and uh, was, I was mostly um, living in Indonesia in my childhood and got to uh, spend time with a wide array of communities and cultures um, elsewhere in, in Southeast Asia. I was homeschooled by our mother and um, until middle school and uh, found that uh, learning moved well beyond the lines <laughs> of uh, uh, prescriptive um, education and uh, beyond the classroom wow. walls. Great. And when did you come to Hawaii and when did you start Punahou School? We came to Hawaii when I was 14 okay. and I started then. It was uh, 1984. Nice. And then what colleges did you end up going to? So I spent a couple of years at Barnard in New York uh, City. I got my master's in um, NYU in New York City and my PhD uh, here at Hawaii. Nice, and mm -hmm. you, your husband is Conrad and you have two beautiful daughters, Suhaila mm -hmm. and Savita. Yes. Um, can you tell me what activities they're interested in now? Well, it's wonderful to see them kind of outgrowing me. Suhaila is not only several inches taller than me, but at wow. the age of 14, she has interests and capacities that stretch beyond that which I've given to her. And um, I think the wonderful thing about uh, being a mother to these girls is that I'm constantly learning from them. They are my biggest teachers. And it's a um, uh, pleasure to see them growing into compassionate, thoughtful, service-oriented individuals, and uh, those are my non-negotiables. Um, <laughs> my youngest has green-blue hair, you know, obviously I don't much care uh, what color your hair is, but, uh, um, but she is, a, you know, creative and, uh, and deeply loving, and uh, they uh, allow me to um, think about how my commitment to young people is about um, nurturing a world um, in which they will be safe and, and recognized, valued, and, and fortified. And your mom sounds like she was an amazing woman. And uh, you actually wrote a book about Sahela and your mom. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, sadly, our mother died nine years before Suhaila was born. And um, I came across, when I was um, pregnant with Suhaila, uh, two boxes of books and toys and mom had written across the top of one of them for Maya's children. Nice. So that made me so sad, but it also um, made me realize the great gifts that I had been given by this extraordinary woman. And it allowed me to really think about what uh, she gave to me that I would want to pass on to my daughter, but also uh, what stories about her I could share so that the lessons that she imparted 
um, would um, would would have meaning to my daughter. And so this book is uh, uh, an effort to imagine an evening spent between my mother and my daughter. And so she comes down and invites Suhela up uh, to the moon, um, uh, a space that is uh, healing. And mom really did love the moon. She said that everywhere you go, the moon is the same. And so it was for her a connecting force that governed the tides and allowed us all um, to be and feel together. So the book is sort of a peace education book about um, the need to see things from other perspectives, about the need to be um, integrated and and um, to see our uh, future and in, in the, the future of others and to be compassionate and um, uh, forgiving and to recognize the strength of young people as well. I think the book is absolutely brilliant. I love Thank the you. book. Every child in the world needs to have that book. Thank you. And your brother, your famous brother, but I also say that you're the famous sister. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you both are mm -hmm. very close. Um, how's your relationship with him? Well, it's good because he's such a good man. And I really think about leadership, um, you know, with him as an example, uh, being about uh, remaining grounded in, in your story and in your, in your roots, but also um, connecting to so many people far and wide. So I think he's a wonderful international leader, for instance. I think that um, he is really focused now, even post-presidency, on um, building out civic engagement, on identifying other leaders. So it's a sort of generous leadership. It's not only democratic, but it's um, about uplifting um, others and, and engaging in transformative um, leadership that allows for people at the grassroots level as well as the governmental level to engage all of their skills and talents. So I'm very fortunate to have him as a brother and as a as a um, an uncle to my daughters. But also I'm grateful now to be able to uh, work with the Obama Foundation as a consultant to help to build the Asia Pacific Leadership Program, uh, which is about identifying. Um, leaders in the Asia Pacific uh, who have uh, done a lot but need perhaps support um, through wraparound um, mentorship and um, innovation and and uh, um, and and also uh, philanthropy uh, to take their projects to the next level. So these are leaders who are committed to the region, who are embedded. They are. Um, people who are, have boots on the ground, who are um, active and uh, fully um, uh, optimistic, but also um, in possession of a strong awareness of the challenges of the region and who are working to uh, prioritize and utilize all of the resources of the region, which are abundant. And they're committed to working with one another as well. So we had a wonderful convening in January that um, brought 21 leaders from all over the region together um, to do leadership development, futures thinking around uh, issues like the intersection of climate and peace, and also um, uh, design thinking to help us uh, design the, the future of programming. They connected with high school leadership programs and uh, did huaka'i to get a strong sense of root and host culture, and uh, they fell in love with Hawaii, and it, it was a wonderful beginning. No, oh, that sounded like it was a great, uh, great convention, and, and the Obama Foundation is just absolutely amazing, but I also have to interject there and say that your brother is lucky to have a great sister like you. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> now, you. Maya, I want to ask you, how was your experience speaking in front of the Democratic National Convention? I mean, it was it was obviously awesome in the in the original sense of that word. I think that um, the convention was um, uh, one of the spaces where you felt the full energy and force of uh, and wonder and, and power of the American people. And um, my hope is that um, uh, we we feel that again soon. Um, we've got, uh, I think what promises to be a very interesting uh, race in 2020. But um, what became clear to me um, at the convention and during the campaign beforehand is that uh, there is so much creativity. There is so much 
uh, loving kindness. There's so much um, um, determination and strength in, in uh, leaders all over this country, leaders who are uh, unseen very often, um, unsung uh, too often. And um, really, uh, it helps me to fall in love with this country and all that um, it promises and provides um, to the world um, and to its citizens when it is at its best. Yeah. And so I want everyone to get involved and to um, really participate to become civically engaged, not only to vote, but also to think about building actions that will help us to be and feel strong and benevolent and connected with one another. Maya, I've always been curious about this. When your brother first won the presidency, what was it like for you walking into the White House for the first time? Well, as a um, U.S. history teacher, uh, I was, um, you know, quite uh, moved by the experience, um, being able to participate um, in such intimate ways and to, and to um, bear witness to the way that government works um, in this country was instructive and it was um, uh, it was it was powerful um, I think that what you do see is that um, the White House is um, a place that has the 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 mark and the story of so so many it's wonderful that people get to take tours of the lower floor and that this is a house that does belong to the people. And um, I thought that that was um, important uh, symbolically. And, and um, it was a, a beautiful space. And um, it, there is an opportunity uh, you know, to really see um, now, as I look back, that uh, my brother, who is no longer there, that he did um, make an impact that was quite profound in terms of, in my view, um, helping to increase human rights and civil rights and expectations and to empower voices that didn't feel powerful. And I remember the White House being lit up with the rainbow, for instance. Nice. And, you know, in, at various times, the, the House, I think, you know, it reflects not just the occupants, in other words, um, although they leave their mark, but it also reflects um, the, the will of this nation. Yeah. How, how has your brother changed through the years? Have you seen any change in him? Um, no, I've, I'm, I've quite frequently said that he remains true to himself. Uh, he is really unchanged in his, um, in his demeanor, in his uh, relationships, in, his, mm, in, in, in the things that matter to him, in his work. Um, I think that, of course, he has learned a lot um, about the world, and he has developed a very uh, strong and, and unique uh, commitment to um, thinking about what he has the power to do moving forward. So he's writing his book, and in it we'll, um, we'll get a chance to see his, uh, his vision and his experience, but also um, in the foundation there is um, still uh, on ongoing commitment to the kind of leadership that um, that he that he developed and honed over the the years. Yeah. No. And how, so I have a question, Maya. How do you? What do you do to keep him humble and grounded? What do you do as a sister to to help help him in that way? Well, again, I think he is just sort of. Um, naturally grounded i don't know about humble but um <laughs> but he's grounded he he um, has a strong sense of connection uh, to his past to the people who know him and love him he is um he has a strong sense of loyalty and um and uh, commitment to um you know the, the communities he continues to serve so i don't have to do that um you know that's what I will say is that through, um, you know, the relationship that we have, I, th I think I present sort of continuity and a safe space for him to um, receive uh, love and to be reminded of who he was before he became famous and 
to, um, I don't know if I uh, can really impact his uh, humility. You have to have a healthy ego <laughs> to, uh, to run for president. <laughs> but uh, but, but um, I think that I, um, helped, I help him to remember um, uh, what is important and yeah. who he is, you know? Yeah, no, those are great, great insights there. Maya, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, I want to talk to you about your amazing Seeds of Peace organization. All right, sounds good. You are watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii with my special guest, Dr. Maya Sutoro Ng. We will be back in a quick minute. Hey, aloha, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. I'm Andrew Lang, the host of Security Matters Hawaii. I'm airing here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, and I'm trying to bring this community information, security information specifically, that will help you live a safer life, help keep our community safer, and help keep our, our businesses safer. Um, so join me, because security matters. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. <music> Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My special guest today is the extraordinary Dr. Dr. Maya Satoru Ng, and today we are going beyond the first family. Maya, you're, you're a co-founder of that incredible organization called Seeds of Peace. Can you tell me about okay. that? Yeah, Carrie Yurosevich, who's a sort of early childhood and family expert, she and I uh, co-founded Seeds of Peace a few years ago. Um, to help um, rebrand peace and to expand um, uh, to um, schools and uh, to the community. And the idea is to bring together educators, family, and community leaders in a 360 approach and to work on the algorithm of developing peace within, peace between, and peace and service to the community. And so our hope is that um, by doing these workshops that involve um, a three-part, you know, series uh, where uh, not only do participants uh, hear from uh, extraordinary organizations, initiatives, uh, nonprofits, educators, and youth in the community, but also develop action plans um, uh, that you know all of the participants um, uh, also present. Uh, I can see that in these efforts. Um, that people feel empowered uh, to do more. So families feel empowered to contribute to the schools. Uh, schools feel empowered to connect to the community. Community leaders um, give richly to, um, uh, to the schools and um, offer space for families to um, be uh, healthy and, and happy together. So there is a sense of bridge building, of course, but also of individual empowerment so that each person understands that there is so much that we can individually, um, as well as collectively, do to um, begin um, activating the resilience of our communities and uh, through the utilization of, of uh, the incredible resources that we have. So it's a real strength-based approach. And it's about seeing pieces action-oriented about our daily commitments to one another. So ac you know, our action plans may involve um, mural building for a, a, an artist that creates a community space or, um, you know, prosecutor's office creating opportunities for um, restorative practices or uh, children, uh, you know, authoring uh, books together in the first grade on their definitions of peace. So they're really a wide variety of action plans. Well, you know, knowing you, you have a passion for peace. I mean, it, it's amazing, your passion. And how did you get that passion? Did you have some experience uh, that kind of guided yeah. you in this way? So I think that for me, there were both negative and positive experiences that guided me. When I was young, I did experience um, some of the um, discrimination I, I witnessed, um, uh, you know, in, in communities where many people were 
poor and uh, underrepresented and under-resourced. Um, I also saw um, people who, um, you know, were violent towards one another, even though they were good people, um, who discriminated against um, uh, Chinese, for instance, in Indonesia, um, because they had scapegoated, you know, Chinese people and thought that um, uh, Indonesian Chinese were responsible for their um, economic problems or that sort of thing. And so what became clear to me was that we need to prioritize um, the work of mining our own interiors, of reflection, of remembering who we are at our best and making sure that we hold one another accountable. So that requires a development of compassion. Of un we need to understand each other's stories and so forth. And so the positive work of peace building that I witnessed was probably in New York, working in schools that were um, community oriented, where I could see that um, together a community could build a space, could transform abandoned lots into community gardens and could create both safety and um, a greater sense of social justice and inclusion, that sort of thing. So um, I really started thinking in New York about uh, the work of schooling as being about uh, the humanizing uh, potential that uh, comes from learning and, and growth and uh, trying to move uh, away from the memorization of discrete facts to be regurgitated and then quickly forgotten and into um, education that is about meaningful and purposeful connection and um, action and contribution to community. And so that for me is the definition of peace. It's really about, um, you know, it's about community, it's about connection, and it's about um, having a um, growth mindset so that each of us can contribute to human rights and social justice and environmental justice, and we can um, negotiate and, and um, um, feel compassion for one another, and we can uh, feel um, uh, also a sense of personal peace. And but empathy as empathy. well. It's, yeah, so it's so, everyone's definition is different, which is why there are innumerable pathways and yeah. why the work is um, prevalent and never done. Yeah. Maya, what's, a, what's an important lesson you've learned in your life so far? So one of the lessons that I've learned, and, and this is related to um, my purpose as a peace builder and this idea of, of looking at peace again, uh, rebranding it as being very pragmatic, and you know, is that um, is that people who are perhaps in positions of conflict, you know, are um, just not uh, aware of one another's universal needs, but that um, that uh, when we become um, uh, aware of the fact that each of us really at any given moment is just searching for uh, love or understanding or a sense of hope or a sense of um, a family or um, safety, that we can really be generous with one another. One of the ways that I learned this was um, by um, looking at the online presence of uh, a woman who was being very harsh with me and my family, um, but I could see that she had a lot of love for her children and for her pets. And I recognized a, the, the human being in her and began to see that she was doing the best that she could with the information she had and that, um, you know, the, that it's important to become aware of um, the, one another's needs so that we can think about how we can contribute to you know, how I can make her feel safer and, and uh, heard, that for instance. Yeah, totally. And Maya, I want to ask you, who inspires you? Do, is there someone or some people that inspires yes. you? So, so historically, I guess the people who are committed to nonviolent social change are the most inspiring. You know, everyone thinks about Gandhi King and here, Lilu Kalani. Um, but there are so many others who are sort of Un, unsung or lesser known. And um, when I was um, in India a couple of months ago, I had the chance to work with the United States Institute of Peace 
I'm on their advisory council, and I worked with a group called Generation Change. It's a group of young um, leaders from conflict spaces. So these are young leaders from you know, Myanmar, from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Congo, from all of these different countries all over the world. And every day, they do this work of uh, championing uh, democracy or um, helping to create greater inclusion or healing um, people's traumas and educating uh, the future generation. And they do it in very difficult circumstances with a lot of tension and few resources. And they um, were really inspiring to me. The Dalai Lama gave uh, you know, them several hours a day for three of the days to engage in dialogue about peace building leadership. I admired his commitment given, you know, he's not a young man. Uh, <laughs> he showed great tenacity and energy, I thought. Wow, that's amazing to, about the Dalai Lama. Yeah. And um, Maya, you know, every, I mean, you're obviously making a huge positive impact with countless people and you're very successful. I want to ask you, was there an obstacle or a challenge that you had to overcome in your life? Well, I think we all have to overcome obstacles. The truth is that life is hard and suffering, you know, uh, <laughs> abounds. Um, but um, I would say that I've had fewer obstacles than most. Um, but I did struggle quite a bit in my earlier years with um, gender discrimination, with sexual harassment, with sexual abuse, with you know, microaggressions. And, you know, that's something that now is being talked about um, in earnest. And I'm grateful for those conversations. And um, I think that an important part of um, the future of leadership is to really help us to think um, anew about what it means to, um, you know, to be a woman or to be a man or or maybe we're just breaking down uh, those, those uh, gender dichotomies altogether. But just thinking about um, the humanizing um, need uh, to um, uh, be respectful, careful, kind, um, and thoughtful with one another. I think that um, a lot of the um, women that I'm meeting these days do have a, a bit of trauma. And, and I think we uh, are in need of healing, you know, uh, and um, I'm hopeful that uh, a lot of the dialogue and movement building today can uh, help us get there. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. And Maya, before we wrap up, I want to ask you one more thing. You've accomplished a ton in your life already, mm -hmm. but what do you hope to aspire to achieve in your future still? Well, I do, um, I do really feel like there's still a lot of work to be done to sort of rebrand peace. And I want to, I want to um, do more uh, writing and I want to really support um, these leaders, um, not just in the Asia Pacific, but around the world uh, and help them to um, enact and, and, and engage um, their talents and skills and courage um, to uh, think about um, helping others. I talked about healing a moment ago, and I really think the key to healing is servant leadership and really contributing to others. And I want, um, you know, as, as is noted in your book, the, the importance of purpose uh, is, is something that I'm aware of um, all of the time. I want to help um, young people, uh, lots of young people, to uh, find and name their sense of purpose and to um, do more collaborative work and to connect. We live in a globalized world. But we underutilize, for instance, technology as a source of connection. We use it a lot to criticize each other or to, um, to get lost in uh, spaces that are not loving or, uh, or, or productive. And so I really want to think about how to forge strong and, and enduring connections in a world that, that needs it. Maya, I, I could, we need more time. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. I have to, I want to thank you for thank you. being on Beyond the Lines today. Thank you so you much. You are someone that definitely go beyond the lines. You're so inspirational. You have great positive energy. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you for everything, Maya. Thank you. Aloha. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. And a special thank you to my clothing sponsor, Iolani Incorporated. For more information, please visit my website, rustykomori.com. And my book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all Costco stores in Hawaii. 
I hope that this show inspires you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.